Uh, it is Professor James Jordan from the US. Hello. Hello, um, how are you? Very well. Uh, how are you? I am good, thank you. What time is it, it at your is, place? It's around uh, noontime, which means that our new puppy may be barking uh, for her walk. <laughs> Um, so if you hear that, uh, I'll apologize in advance. Oh, not at all. That's wonderful. I think it's just a, it's it's lighten up everything because I think it's so um, amazing to have all these different time zones. Um, because uh, yeah, for others it's just like evening or surely got to be evening, evening soon. So you have okay. um, uh, the joy of our last keynote, and I'd like to introduce you to our audience. Um, you are the president and CEO of Stratatic uh, Incorporation, which enables both Fortune 500 and startup companies to develop their go-to market, commercialization and business development strategies. You are also a distinguished service professor of healthcare and biotechnology at Carnegie Mellon University's Heinz College. Um, where you have published numerous articles and books on innovation, startups, intellectual property, and health system. And today we have the pleasure on um, hearing you um, about digital transformation of the healthcare system. Please, um, I'll give you the stage. Thank you very much. Um, well, first of all, maybe I'll step back a little bit because what seems to me as I'm listening to this, usually I like to go to conferences and you physically walk around and you get a, a sense of what people are talking about. And I generally can adjust my presentation to that. And so um, it feels like I'm bridging both what we're talking to today to what we're talking to over, over the next few days. And I, I think as I listen to people talk today, um, it struck me some of my journey. So I, I started out on the manufacturing side of healthcare. I worked for Johnson & Johnson and Boston Scientific. And what, what struck me is in the 80s, we went through this just-in-time crisis in this country. And basically that country was our manufacturing base was going away because we had no process excellence, that the challenges um, that we had in our system where uh, very much finance was running it and the people that were doing the work weren't giving input. And I just listened to all these conversations on lean management, models of care and value-based care. And it's so much aligned with what went on at that point in time. Even the last dialogue, you know, you would call them quality circles to get feedback at the time in manufacturing and leadership needing to change their attitude. And there was a whole group of of senior executives that, that needed serious training uh, to be able to uh, listen and have participatory management. And quite frankly, some had to leave the system. And it sounds like as I listen to this dialogue, um, there's uh, there's something very close to that going on in, in healthcare right now. And I, I think, you know, the, the situation is in a system that's so big, there's there's no one way of looking at things. There's so many ways of understanding it. And our dialogue has really been that, that mistakes are our gift to really discovering how to improve the system. And I think this presentation is a little bit out there in the sense of giving you a sense of what a real-time healthcare system should be and how the information of the health system is gonna start going out and grabbing more uh, information. And this has been a dialogue in the United States for you know, really 15 or 20 years, but it's interesting because it's on one hand, hard to plan during a crisis. And on the other hand, uh, COVID, uh, a crisis can cause us to be motivated to get some of the systems. And of course, I heard some people talk today in the earlier presentations about uh, SNOMED and the International Classification of Disease 11 coming out where we're trying to design it so that we have more clinical language in there, that we have more standardization in the systems, which are all things that have to happen before our dialogue here today. So I just wanted to, you know, put that in as a context. And so, you know, when I think about, I'm writing a book on health systems right now, and what strikes me is I always like to go back and start with history. And you can go back and realize that all the great religions, not every single one of them, really um, contributed to the formation of the healthcare systems that we have today. And I can think even when I was a kid, my grandmother lived with us, Dr. Wally would still come to our house and take care of my grandmother. And so as we started to make bigger systems now, um, our fragmentation, which at the, at the 
early days helped with intimacy, right? Dr. Wally knew my grandmother. He knew all her quirks and all her issues, what she was going to comply with, what she wasn't going to comply with. As, as we roll that up, um, this fragmentation contributes to really a systemic misalignment and, and really strong challenges and coordination and innovation allocation of resources. I was talking to a, a cardiology friend of mine about 10 years ago about what he saw changing in hospital administration. And he said, you know, the power was moving from the clinician to the MBAs. And you hear a little bit of that today in some of the dialogues that we have that, you know, they, we need those skills. Uh, we need that insight that they can provide. But at the end of the day, it's about a patient and it's about a life. And so, you know, the promise here is a systems approach can actually communicate how these skills can interrelate and the dynamic parts can come together to improve outcomes. And the fact of the matter, by having a picture view, uh, a systems approach actually encourages us to be non-biased. And so the last dialogue about safety and dialogue about it's not my fault, um, you know, systems approach has that intellectual curiosity of, of what in the system let us down to have that issue with the patient that we have or to have that death that we have. And that's, you know, that's a, a pretty, um, a pretty hard thing to do and systems can help us do that. So I recently gave a talk in, in India uh, with a group of MBA students. And I was trying to say, you know, regardless of what industry that you're in, uh, marketing has a role to play. And that, that might seem like an odd topic here. Uh, we think of marketing as, as growing sales, but in healthcare, we also think about it as reducing costs so we can take the limited dollars that we have and, and offer more services. And so, you know, what we're really trying to understand is, is customer requirements for our system. And the reality is um, most of the requirements of our system, because they've been fragmented and put together, we haven't had a purposeful design of what those requirements are. So a lot of those requirements are latent requirements. And some of the conversations about crash carts and what we put on them or uh, conversations uh, for patients speaking up or, or nurses speaking, speaking up, those are all uncovering requirements. And so, you know, once we understand those things, we can design our system appropriately. So, you know, if you think about it from, I have a very industrial engineer mindset here. So if you think of, of here where we talk about uh, customer requirements, um, it's really understanding what those requirements are. Now, those requirements um, can be very strange things. I think of a time uh, when- uh, Excuse me, excuse me, Dr. John, do we have, uh, do we should see your presentation? I'm awfully yeah. sorry to interrupt. Oh, no, thank you so much. Yes, you should. Um, it says I'm, it says <laughs> I'm sharing sure it. If just um um can you see it now yes Wonderful. all right i'm gonna go back for two seconds um that, that was my context <laughs> questions promise perspective right so fragmentation systems thinking can have positive outcomes uh our systems approach communicates how the interrelated parts put together and again we're trying to get to a non-biased view and I was speaking about marketing as, as understanding customer requirements. And we, we think of that concept as driving sales from an MBA perspective. But as a systems administrator with given fixed uh, resources, I'm thinking about that if I can reduce uh, the non-value added activities that actually I can increase my services. So I apologize for, for that. And thank you for interrupting me. I'll, I'll pause. Is there any questions? Because I did sort of have to <laughs> start in the middle there. I don't see any, so I'll, I'll keep going. No, so this is simply, fine. yeah, this, this is simply a little model um, that I have used and, and blowed out a lot of details in it. But if you think about it, if you truly understand what the patient needs um, and you design your system around it, you're going to get the actual results that you want. Those results could be satisfaction, cost, right? So I have a, a formula to me for outcomes is maximizing availability, maximizing quality and reducing absolute cost. And I, I use the word absolute cost because uh, in hospitals, it's really easy to cost trade among departments. I could be selling into a interventional cardiology suite and tell you that I'm saving you cost, but I'm passing it downstream or I'm, I'm passing it you know, as an input. So it, that's important. And so when we think of what can go wrong, we have the concept of having bad benchmarks to the customer expectation, meaning it's an expectation that we did not understand. And therefore our system was designed without that input from the very beginning. And that's a problem. And then of course we have conformance issues, which could be the service conformance. It could be the process conformance. And again, our nursing folks have talked about this, this a lot today. 
But you know, when we talk about in traditional marketing about generating demand, there's also this concept now of digital vaccines of how do we communicate on a more consistent level with our patients through all these different traditional methods that have a, a marketing orientation to it. And we just sort of switch it to healthcare words. Um, how can we create an intimacy so that, that people understand uh, the implications of things? And also at the same time, how can we appropriately with the appropriate privacy um, detection be able to anticipate things? And so uh, there was an experiment between uh, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center and Carnegie Mellon University uh, with having some elder folks being released and um, opting in so this is a you know would have been a privacy issue without them opting in could we monitor their uh, social media and look for certain words and what we discovered is a real pattern on just mother to daughter daughter to sister whatever it is talking post procedure where people could intervene almost 25 to 33 percent quicker with the words that are being spoken which gave an indication that are, that something was going to occur before the event occurred and so there's an example of how these tools can become uh, available and, and helpful. So, you know, at the end of the day, when we think of our context with the US healthcare system, it's how do we understand these, these customer requirements and that we need some intelligence from our community in terms of how to understand how to meet those expectations. And there are business tools that have been well vetted to do that, that we have to convert into something that has a little more spiritual in it because healthcare is more spiritual. And what we're trying to do along the way is eliminate all the non-value added activities um, so that either you, know, you can maximize profit of the system and you know, we think of profit as, as a bad thing, but if you're a nonprofit firm, you can plow it back. Um, and if you're a for-profit firm, uh, as we have in the, in the U.S., as long as there's boundaries around your quality, um, there's nothing wrong with, with motivating people to, to, to make profit. Now, probably something that um, those outside the U.S. Uh, wouldn't necessarily know, but prior to healthcare reform in 2010, believe it or not, we did not tie financial performance and quality together. And now it's it's tied together at various degrees, and there's a whole history on that I could go into. But it's kind of shocking <laughs> that it didn't exist. And I, I know in other countries that it's uh, always been you know part of it. So if we step back from that sort of context, what's a real time healthcare system? What are the challenges? What are its benefits? You know, what are we going after? What are our goals? And what are the steps we can, we can do? And so you know, COVID has emphasized the importance of flex flexible structures. So I think that um, I'm, I'm, I think that our scientists had limited knowledge of the disease, and so we worked on that. Uh, our healthcare system failed to anticipate surges in cases. And so the impact of that is a relevant portion of our early death was really caused by lack of preparedness. And so government and public health coordination was needed to predict the these cases and the best care protocols needed to be shared. Now, um, of particular note in, in the US, the healthcare system, the delivery of healthcare and public health have always sort of been very, very different. And this is this has forced them to sort of come together. And so that I think is, is has been a positive outcome. But you know, the issue on the bottom left here is healthcare system structures have proven to be inflexible and, and lack real-time knowledge of the changes in volume. And you know, from a process perspective, I heard someone earlier talking about the intake of protocols and understanding risk assessments. Well, in, in process management words, I'd be trying to take that risk assessment and align them to what they call a swim lane process, right? Oh, you go here, you go here, you go here. And um, there's been a significant um, lack of really having that those systems available. And that lag time um, has inhibited our health systems from changing capacity um, and, and solving problems. And so a dialogue has, has reinitiated that's really a very old dialogue, but we need this sort of real time uh, patient population intelligence and for the healthcare system itself, a lot of that actionable data is outside of, of healthcare delivery, which by its sort of nature is acute, uh, at least in, in the US. And so we need to work on that. So, you know, what is a real-time healthcare system? It's designed to optimize workflows 
and have instant access to all the relevant data of all patients. And as I said earlier, I think you know some of these aspects of what I'm talking about are going to be hard to do until we have ICD-11 institutionalized. And that doesn't mean launched. It, it takes several years to get it to where it needs to go. Um, and so the main goal of this is to anticipate and, and change our swim lanes if we have to, or change the capacity of our swim lanes so that we can enhance care. And it creates a patient-centric environment. And so I started to say, uh, before I realized my slides weren't up, is that um, I tell the Aunt Ola story. And so this would be my father's great aunt. Um, she needed a valve replacement. And at the time, you know, one of the great pleasures of working for Johnson & Johnson, one of these world-class companies is they will get you the best doctor in the world for your family. It's just a, a, a I'm having a moment. <laughs> it's a wonderful thing. It's a real blessing to have that. And my aunt wouldn't go into Boston to get this done. She wanted to go to Bon Secours Hospital down the street. And you say, Auntie, why would you do that? I'll take you in. Like, I really want you to have the best care in the world. Now, her definition of best care, because she was the equivalent of the elderly candy striper in this hospital, she volunteered. She knew the people. She felt it was comfortable. Um, she knew the nurses. She knew the people that would support her. And so her definition of quality was very different, different from my definition of quality. And so, you know, we have to understand those, those components uh, systemically, which again is a, a piece that we've never really uh, been as, as um, understanding of. And of course, like with the concept of just in time and lean, um, the word Kaizen, if that means anything to you in Japanese, continuous improvement, it's a never ending journey. And just when we get something right, we're going to find something else. And so as we were talking about safety and we were talking about risk, the journey of continuous improvement requires, requires input from the workers. And that attitude has to have an open environment. And I think of just violating that trust once um, takes things back so far. I mean, you can have a quality circle where for months and months and months, everything's going really well, people are opening up, and then the boss says something critical and that openness just sort of collapses overnight. And so it's so hard. Um, and so a lack of real-time intelligence and flexible structures really has, as I said, accelerated this. And we use this data to become more efficient at delivering our value proposition. We use it for removing activities that aren't benefiting outcome. And we discover these new specifications that enhance or differentiate our, 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 our product or service. And so this is the US healthcare system on the, on the right. Um, it may be, uh, it's different around the world, but we have our insurers, we have different management organizations in between, and we have the people that supply the products and the providers are here and we've got retail here. Um, as I said, it's, it's a amalgamation of players, each with their own incentives. So I could draw boxes around all these folks and, and tell you how they're incentivized very differently. And so, you know, this is one of our challenges. So payers, they're looking to increase their revenue, which is their premiums. And they're looking to decrease cost, which is benefits without losing market share. Now, um, again, I mentioned that uh, prior to 2010, and it was probably more like 15 to 16 before we got into implementation in the US, um, payers could collect their money and there was no law on how much had to go back out into the provider network. And so the new laws in the US say that payers can't keep more than 20 cents on the dollar. They're around at 15.1 now. And if you, you think about you know, your credit card, you think about an American Express card versus a Visa, everyone complains the American Express is looking to take 3%, <laughs> should be less. Well, these people are taking 15.1% right now. And so the question is, what are they doing with that? And that's, I think we can get off on, on, on what I think is going to happen in the future with that. But I think that's, that's important to understand, but that's their motivation. And the suppliers, they're looking to increase their revenue. They're looking to increase their margin. And, and they want to do it really with as, as little evidence of, of value as they can get away with. And, and that's not to say that um, they don't care. It's that they are not being on that side of the box aware of all the system requirements in the healthcare delivery system. And so they're gonna take a view that matches their view. For example, um, I've been in interventional cardiology, I've been in, in, uh, in renal, I've been in vascular surgery. And every time we 
would launch a product to talk about outcomes, we would do it through that, that purview. Uh, we had no ability to step back and say, what does this mean in the entire healthcare system? We never had the ability to say, oh, a, a AAA stent graft will solve this particular problem for you, but we didn't realize that it increases maybe diabetes four years from now. I mean, we wouldn't have that view, right? That's important to know. And certainly if these companies knew that, they would uh, engage in that, but that's their motivation. And, and finally, the providers themselves are uh, very, uh, they're mostly reimbursed for uh, acute care. And so um, really as it relates to chronic care, it's, it's only relatively recently that we realized that the reduction in the cost of chronic care can have a very significant impact on the system in a, in a whole bunch of number of ways. And we heard some talks about that today, but just to give that sort of, sort of context. So the benefits of real time is this sort of digitization, which I call perception, allows us to create models of comprehension uh, to be able to think ahead and, and create this loop so that we can, we can make decisions. And I think this is really what we hope um, that our leadership and institutions uh, are, are really moving towards is the systemic intellectual curiosity for detail, because that is really what drives the system. It's something our clinicians understand, our nurses understand. Um, it's in their heads and we have to get it out and we have to you know, put it in, in a system. So um, continuing on, I talked earlier about to, you know, what should this serve? And I talked about my definition of, of outcomes. Um, but when you think of, of access, I want to be able to reduce the, the uninsured. And this is maybe more of an issue in the US than other countries that have more socialized medicine. I want to increase prevention. Um, I think of an exercise that I was very much involved with, with McKesson, which is like the biggest, one of the biggest companies no one knows about. And they had a, um, a congestive heart failure model. And don't hold me to these numbers because it was a decade ago, but I'll give you a perspective on it, is uh, they started out on the service side, just answering phones for, for the blues, you know, calling up these patients and checking their water weight and checking their salt content, and their diet and their blood pressure and those various details. And because they weren't making a lot of money on that, um, they decided to uh, try to see if they can optimize the system as best they can. And, you know, McKesson, uh, Amerisource, Bergen, Cardinal, these companies have more pharmacists than even our pharmaceutical industry. And so they put the pharmacists to looking at this and they came back and they said, whoa, wait a minute, the average congestive heart failure patient averages $64,000 a year with at the time, a, a variance from a low of 49,000 to a high of a quarter of a million dollars. And you guys are doing it consistently for 57. So we can now go bid to the insurance companies we'll take it for 57. And if you're a finance person say, this is something in a, in a system where I can't plan, now I can plan, I'll take it. And so that was a conversation really about the phone calls and the prevention. And when they look into what really helped with that prevention, very early on, the nurses recognized that it was about um, six minutes for a phone call. And they recognized that um, these patients who were relatively immobile, um, would enjoy that call as a visit. And they realized, okay, if I can get it down to two minutes to take your vitals, and if you're well-behaved, we get to have a three-minute visit or a four-minute visit. Um, and if you don't, you're going to hear a lecture from me for six. Um, that's a little bitty detail that I'll tell you what, there's no CEO that's ever going to get that level of detail, right? It was the nurses getting that level of detail. And the nurses decided that they were going to team up for each patient so that the patient knew the person. So meaning if someone, nurse one was out tomorrow, you know, nurse two would be known. And they were able to get the six minutes down to four. They were able to keep the, the prevention up and just a, a great result all along, right? And so two things were happening with that. Obviously the visit was good. There was literacy going on in there, right? And so uh, getting literacy out to people and, and, and what they mean and, and understanding um, not only literacy in the patient themselves, but literacy and the programs that we create. So for example, um, there's a project in, in, in at Carnegie Mellon University that was working with the public health institution where they were going out and they were bringing uh, healthy food to 
to what they call them food deserts here, right? The inner city where they have more of the McDonald's and the junk food as opposed to the fresh fruits and vegetables. And so um, they made this program and they delivered the food. And the first part of the program was to um, deliver some utensils. And so at the end of the day, um, two things happened. Uh, the people that were delivering the food didn't have a system to know who got utensils and who didn't get utensils. And then those who got utensils got utensils that um, they didn't even know how to use. Meaning that these folks maybe had one pot and pan in their house, they didn't know how to do it. And so at the end of the day, the program failed predominantly because of this silly little piece of, we didn't track delivery of the utensils and we never got a specification for these uh, uh, economically challenged folks, uh, what they had in their kitchens in the first place. And so the program didn't meet its outcome. So the whole goal here, I gave you stories associated with this, but the whole goal is if we have more access and part of that last part of that access is, is interoperability. Now, you know, there's been some great progress uh, through multiple presidents on, on interoperability and certainly the World Health Organization, as you know, was working on this with ICD-11. But, you know, a lot of the healthcare firms also uh, put their toes on the line of interoperability to keep their competitive advantage, right? So we think about the epics and some of these, you know, software companies not letting people in. Um, they're going to try to protect their space. And so this is wonderful balance of, you know, how do you have a competitive environment where, you know, the Epic wants to be the best that Epic can be and, and, and be motivated for all the profit they want to be able to get by performing and having the appropriate policies to make sure that we open up this interoperability. And of course, we talked about quality today, it's error, it's waste, it's measurement. And we talked about cost is, is really having this understanding of absolute cost and long term and, and increasing, you know, in, incentives and, and, and penalties. Um, you know, one of the biggest challenges that, that, that I see is, I understand in my parents' generation that, you know, charging them to smoke um, was, was probably... Uh, it, it might not be fair. I mean, my mother told a story that she was told that as a 16 year old girl that, that her doctor told her if she smoked, she'd stay thin and get a husband. I mean, that's how kind of crazy the world was these, in those days. Um, you know, today we know better, right? So the question is 20 years from now, if someone decides to, to um, you know, abuse themselves, um, where is, you know, where's the penalty for that? And so it's so hard to sort of understand that. But again, I talked about the, the, the progress we've made in, in the US. And so I, I asked the question, of course, now this has been blown out with COVID. So this won't be as, as true at the moment. But the question did, by putting in uh, the health care reforms in the US that we did to try to bring the system together, did we see a change in, in national healthcare expenditures? And so you can see the decade here and the average gross domestic product, because it's not whether national healthcare expenditure is growing, it's really a question of how far is it deviating from gross domestic product, because that's the financial health of our countries, right? And so um, the long story short is, is in the US, there seems to be very early signs that this systemic view and these understanding of having quality systems and, and, and carrots as rewards and sticks as penalties, um, that there's some progress that's being made. So let's discuss you know, really the concept of, of digitization. And this is uh, <laughs> very complex, but it, it starts with sort of understanding uh, the patient's journey. And you know, when you think about for the far left here, we've got health and then we've got, you know, monitoring of care uh, on, on the right, but they, they go through these journeys. And for the most part in the gray here is really where we are today. It's, it's sort of, you know, understanding the electronic healthcare record. Uh, we're starting to use our medical devices as, um, you know, electronic data capture devices. That's starting to happen. We're starting to see some clinical decision support, maybe a little precision medicine going on in, in, in some places. But all these things are in the context of the healthcare system itself. It's not reaching out into other parts of the system. And so here's simply a map, and, and we don't have a lot of time to go through this. This is from Gardner, who does a, a fantastic job with this, um, going through all the things that sort of need to happen to be able to get uh, more and more information. I actually think tomorrow there's a conversation on the health information exchange too. So I think we can see these, these, these changes being made. And what's interesting to me is um, why, I, why I love uh, healthcare. I thought as a, as a little kid, I thought it'd be the coolest thing to, 
be the operations person of an airport uh, because of its complexity, right? It's just complex that flights can come in and flights cannot come in and you have to adjust, you have to get everyone where they're going. And now that I'm in healthcare, I thought, wow, that's hard. But at least all of those changes that you were making, the delays are happening from an input perspective, but the processes never change, they're fixed. And in healthcare, our processes, our swim lanes have to change according to the variability of our patients, which again, can be infinite from that perspective. So, you know, step two, with what sort of adjunctive technologies can we, we use so that, that patients can, can self-manage, right? And so we do have a lot of social media, a lot of interactive, we saw earlier interactions with phones that are negative, right? Some of that stuff's negative. How can we use it as a positive? Um, I've worked with some companies that have done, particularly with children, gamification, where they've been able to, you know, teach them diet or diabetic children, teach them, you know, the impact on uh, glucose levels and the food they take through, game of, through games. Um, and so, you know, these concepts of using these social tools to be able to create a uh, capacity for any individual to understand and, and process their disease. They call that digital, digital vaccines. The, um, I'm gonna skip through here, but the, the next step would be, what do we do with all these mobile apps? And we were just talking about that a little bit. Um, I love now that during COVID, um, all of my wellness visits have been you know, from home. And, and my wife and I were talking about this and, and you know, she's like, I used to have to get up an hour early, drive into the city, pay for parking and go through this, this whole process that she doesn't have to do anymore. And um, so the question lies as my general practitioner, you know, having a, a general practitioner visit with me is kind of a curious thing because I go through all this stuff and we talk about healthcare. But he said, you know, at some point I have to touch you and I have to feel you and I have to sort of understand certain things. But uh, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center has, has done something rather interesting. They've made sort of these tertiary care centers outside of the city, particularly associated with cancer, where it's a, a building you can go through to get your tests and you can dial into the city. And there's this wonderful story in the paper about a, you know, 86 year old man, his 80 year old wife, and, you know, coming in for these, these checkups for them, it just exhausted them. And, and quite frankly, took a week, week and a half for them to just not only emotionally and physically recover from the journey. And now they're talking about, they can go down to the street, go into this building, there's a nurse in there, there's equipment in there, they take all the vitals and they have a conversation. I think that, you know, we can see some of those things happening. And I think there's a real debate. Um, I was in a board meeting the other day when insurance companies said, all this is going to go away. And I said, I don't think you understand that the patients won't let it go away now. And so I think COVID has, has, has brought us, um, you know, some of that opportunity from that perspective. And again, the cloud, um, you know, part of the challenge is, is how do you replace these legacy, legacy systems and deployment costs? Um, the cloud really reduces switching costs and it really changes barriers. And, and you know, APIs can allow us to integrate to other systems. I, I'm, I'm shocked every time I, I go to my doctor and I've got the newest Apple Watch or I've got the blood ox because, you know, with COVID, I wanted to get the blood ox. And I can't get this information into my doctor's medical record. I can print it out and bring it on my visit, but I can't send it to him. And, you know, for those of us who might have, uh, you know, white coat blood pressure issues, you know, I say, oh, you're running high. And I can say, listen, doc, look at six past six months. This is what I've been at. Um, and we calibrated and I brought my, um, my, my home monitor with me and we calibrated it was to his, right? So wouldn't it just be easier <laughs> if this information got to him? Finally, you know, it's, it's really about data analytics and, um, you know, a, a funny story, I, I uh, you know, we all have our really smart friends. So growing up, I was the jock and I had this friend that was, you know, just absolutely brilliant at everything he did. He, he's always learning even to this day. And he was the, um, the first CIO of eBay to give you a sense of how smart he is. And he's, he's very um, well, as you can imagine, done very well for himself. And so he decided about um, two years ago to, um, someone asked him to get involved in creating a new insurance company. And I said, Bob, you know, you have no idea <laughs> that the nomenclatures. And so a few months into it, he called me up and he said, you're absolutely right. How can I do analytics when the terms are so different? And even if I get the terms correctly in this health system, it doesn't apply to the next health system so I can make benchmarks. And so these are some of the, the challenges that, that we have. 
And so, you know, what we're trying to do is as healthcare grows and consumes more of our, our economy, it actually pulls away from our ability to create jobs, to create wealth, help, help and put money elsewhere. So it's an important initiative to be able to do this. And a real-time healthcare system must realize that it's, it's actually inside of the bigger economy, which is the point I'm trying to take. And the question is, how do we pull in from that outside economy in ways that are appropriate, like the Apple Watch, like maybe having an Amazon Echo in your house? Uh, what sort of information do we have? And as we know from, you know, around the world that, you know, some of these uh, uh, third world countries are more wired with phones than, than we are because that's how they, you know, they have in Africa have these vast places to run wires. Well, it's easy to have towers, right? And so mobile uh, enablement is, is really an opportunity there from that perspective. And so we can see that there's many places that um, this progress of having disruption technology has, has really helped starting out. And you can see here that healthcare, you know, we're laggard as it relates to um, adopting technology. And that's not, um, that's not unfounded in, in risk, right? I mean, you know, the fact of the matter is that a lot of these uh, technologies that go out there, um, you know, the lean startup tells you just go out there and get a specification out there and just sort of go with it. And the customer will, will tell you where the problems are. Well, that's well and good, but that's not going to work in, in healthcare as much. And so it makes sense to me that we're a lagged, but we're just at the beginning and, and we need to be able to uh, pull this together as, as we go. And so I think, um, you know, what can happen when you have the right attitude is, is I just look at Elon Musk and, and SpaceX, right? Um, if you get into the details of, of this story and you think about what historically would have been the, the incumbents, um, he took a, a different approach to how he puts the product together, whereas other people, you know, that were competing for this journey in the U.S. on who's going to be the, you know, the, the, the privatized people that go to space, um, you know, Boeing uh, was used to a cost plus environment and they were used to having a lot of hardware and a lot of switches. And so when they had a change, um, it wasn't that, you know, something was pushed out overnight over the, over the internet to change the specifications. You had to physically go and, and change and wire things. And so it's really about a design mentality. Now, at the same time, um, you know, you have to be cautious a, about those things. But I think, you know, we're learning that uh, we need to to change the way we we think of these tools and and the benefit of of having that that change. So, one of the things that struck me as I watched my friend go through this um, creating a new insurance company is the biggest challenge they had was the inflexibility of the existing payers to work with them because their infrastructure was so established and it wasn't worth their return on investment to to make a change. And so that's that's part of the challenge. And so once we have these data structures in place, I'm working with so many companies that are coming to me and saying, you know, we've got these artificial intelligence models and it does these things and it all works well and fine on, on a bench. But the fact of the matter, if you don't have the infrastructure to plug into that's stable and predictable and consistent, you can't really go through this artificial intelligence journey as, as quickly as you can. So we do see artificial intelligence in certain departments because it's a closed loop system. I think of like um, imaging packs, those systems are pretty well established and pretty well organized. So you can see some progress being made in, in there. And so you can see it in some places, but the goal would be that our entire healthcare system is, is wired in. And there's a lot of work that we have to do to be able to get there. So, you know, that's really my, my conversation. Um, but I do want to, you know, talk about this slide, which is oriented towards, towards my students, so I apology, but um, the question is, how, do, how does healthcare industry come together? So I do have an academic website called healthcaredata.center in the lower left, where you can go on and you can see um, uh, different views. So I've got, we call them macro and micro maps, where you can see where I've got the clinical management, you've got the verticals under there, like clinical documentation and care planning. You can see all the companies and you can click on the blue there and it'll actually take you to their website. So that's interesting if someone's interested in that. And then I love, you know, again, Gardner is just amazing. Um, and being an academic, I'm fortunate enough to be able to have access to this, but they have these hyper cycles uh, where you can see where technology is. So you can see in the far left that, you know, when they talk about an innovation trigger, it, it really is a long time before it comes to market versus on the, on the far right, 
um, is things that are coming to market. And that's an interactive grid. I also have it on my website, but, but Gardner, if you search this on Gardner, there's a hyperlink in this presentation that will take you to Gardner, where you can actually roll over these dots if that interests you and you can get some information on that. So um, I'll leave you with that. But I mean, I think our journey is that, that COVID has validated the need for this you know, real-time intelligence and adaptive systems and that you, you know, we have understood through this process that we have fragmented structures and workflows that, that need work. And we're trying to build a system that anticipates and adapts. And digitization is, is a, a, a way to get there. Now, at the end of the day, I always say digital transformation is a tool that it's the people that use the tool at the end of the day. So that's where we need to, to go. And healthcare, you know, reformed has really sort of talked about bringing these access quality and cost aspects together where we used to be able to sort of manipulate them depending on where you were in, in the system. And um, I think that early evidence in the US shows that this is a positive direction. And I think a competitive landscape provides evidence that there's lots of really bright people working at this right now. And so I leave you with that, but I will share that um, I've just put a blog series together. So you, you all have this uh, email. It's on my personal website, jfjordan.com. Uh, and you can read further on this, but I, I, I started out by uh, talking about the system and then I start blowing through the, the details of the system. And so that's available to anybody who's, who's interested. That's my story. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Professor Jordan, for this um, um, very, very good um, um, presentation, especially now we know what your uh, aunt is looking for in the healthcare system. I think that really portrays um, also what we have been talking about um, today. Um, one question I'd like to ask you in uh, this context is especially um, now in Germany, Switzerland, France even, we are or basically the, the, the government wants to um, work towards like a patient card where all the data is um, basically put on one uh, like a, a visa or mastercard kind of thing and it does not get to plan there is there's so many obstacles there's so many obstacles in terms of the technical issues but also the consumers they have all different kind of um cards what they're buying in their local supermarket and all these kind of loyalty cards when but when it comes to actually having um these um uh, cards with your digital information about your health on it that's something that blocks it all what is your explanation or what is your um, approach to these issues? So do you, do you think, um, so I, I think a, a, a lot of that is, I'm going to stop my, my screen so I can see you all. I, I think uh, a lot of that is, is fear-based, right? That, that what are they going to do with it? How can I get in there and adjust it? And what's in it for me? And I think that's the piece that, so what is it in that card for you? And what's, what's interesting is um, all, all of our, our governments have some sort of, you know, in the United States, the social security system, you know, we all have some mecha mechanism of tracking towards our retirements and our monies and, and all that. We've become very comfortable with that because our grandparents had it and our parents had it, right? And so there's a legacy and, and the security is sort of there most of the time. And so there's a benefit to it because it's your retirement. You go in and you check it and you fix it and, and all that. I think that we have to get that attitude about our healthcare and the experiments that we're doing in the US. Um, the people that are amazing at going in and engaging in this are mothers. They won't do it for themselves, but they'll go in to make sure that their child has, has the right record, even, even if it's a, a, you know, a dogged issue. And so in the, in the US right now, one of the challenges is, is how do you get to that record and how do you repair it? I have some strange thing on my record that I've been trying to get um, removed for a couple of years, I guess. Well, they had me down as a smoker, never smoked. I think what happened is someone was taking a family intake. My dad was a smoker. And so somehow that's, that's in there, right? So now that wrecks my rating. And it's sort of like, you know, you think of your, your credit rating, um, the government had to come back and, and enforce an adjudication process. So I think, you know, it's, it's probably not a terrible idea. In fact, it's a great idea if you can trust the privacy of it, the security of it, you know, there's so many um, 
my dean at, at, at CMU always says that the technology always uh, evolves faster than the policy, right? Because I, you can do something, it doesn't mean that I'm doing it right or I'm, I'm facing, you know, facing it right. So what happens when you're discriminated against because, um, you know, you have two employees and, and one has a family history of, of cancer, carries the BRCA gene or something like that, right? So I think society hasn't trusted yet and they don't see the benefit in it. Yeah, that could well be. Yeah, thank you very much. Do you have any other questions for Professor Jordan? Downside of the end of the day. <laughs> well, thank you so much um, for your presentation. Um, really, really, really informative. Yeah, so I am afraid we're at the end of all our um, speeches for today, all our keynote speakers, every speech, be, speaker for today. Thank you once again very much from me as a chairperson for today. And I think we are moving on now to a question and answer session if there are any um, regarding the day.